this is our rest day. We just climb a small 13,000 foot mountain. We came from 75 miles that way. Tomorrow we're gonna go over a couple of these. This one, this one. And eventually we're gonna go over here to pick up our last food cache. There's Jenna. And we are on the red line. About halfway through the historic winter of 2023, we knew this could be our opportunity to do something big. We set our sights on the biggest ski tour in the Sierra, the infamous Red Line Traverse. Beginning in early May, over the course of 19 days, for 140 miles, we endeavored to ski as close to the Sierra Crest, the Red Line on the map, as possible. Every story begins somewhere. Ours began with Doug Robinson. Doug is a skier, guide, climber, writer, and historian. He and Peanut McCoy skied the John Muir Trail in the 1970s. They were the first people to do it since Orlin Bartholomew in the 1930s. Ultimately, Doug is the critical link that would connect Jenna and I to the Red Line Traverse in the history of long distance ski touring in the Sierra. The Red Line Traverse is the most badass ski tour that's been done in the Sierra. The original idea of the Red Line is if you look at a map, there's this red line right down the Sierra Crest through the highest part of the Sierra. I'm Doug Robinson and I'm a Sierra fanatic, hopelessly addicted to this mountain range. Doug was the first person we told that we were thinking about attempting the red line traverse. When we were on the route, he was our number one cheerleader. The first people we saw in days, we skied up to them and they were like, are you Greg and Jenna? And we were blown away, like, how do these people know who we were? It just turned out that they had met Doug and he just told him about it a few days ago and said to look out for us. I just love how he's so magnetic and brings people together and we really do owe him a lot of credit for encouraging us and saying, yes, this is a go, do it. Jenna grew up as a hippie at Mount Shasta. That's a hell of a mountain. When I met Jenna, it was not any leap of the imagination at all to know that she's a good skier and a good mountaineer. I grew up with two skier parents. They really do live and breathe skiing, and so I lived and breathed it. It was like a fish in water. Skiing is just like what we did all the time. Having parents that were so devoted to skiing as a way of life, that really did carve out who I am today. Greg Cunningham ambled out here from the East Coast. You know, we were always afraid of the New England skiers out here because they knew how to ski on ice, and we didn't. I grew up in Massachusetts. When I was 17, I moved to Vermont. That was where my life in the mountains really began. In 2010, I moved out west to Kirkwood, California. I began ski patrolling and guiding. Eventually, I became a year-round ski patroller. Greg is the snow forecaster, the avalanche forecaster for the entire ski resort of Kirkwood. He is one of the top handful of people in the Sierra for understanding this snowpack. If he says open the mountain, they can open the mountain. If he says don't open the mountain, they don't. He gets up at 
three or four in the morning and reads the weather forecast and then loads his pack up with dynamite and goes and skis along the top of the ridge and throws bombs into predetermined spots in the snowpack where he knows he can make it slide. Talking with Doug, reading ski mags, and combing through guidebooks led us to three names. Chris Cox, Alan Bard, and Tom Carter, the founding members and creators of the Red Line Traverse. I got to ski the Red Line with two close friends, Chris Cox and uh, Alan Bard. I just love the feel of being in the mountains with those guys, and so it was a great team. I'm Tom Carter, and um, the Red Line was our dream back in the early 80s. The trio completed the Red Line in pieces from 1981 to 1983. It wasn't until 2017 that someone would do it in a single stretch. His name was Jed Porter. Jed is a mountain guide who spent a lot of time in the Sierra. He dusted this trip off. He became the first person to do it continuously and he also did it solo. I'm Jed Porter. I did my version of the Red Line Traverse in 2017. It took me 16 days to do it from Mount Whitney to Mammoth. I lived in Bishop for 12 years, sort of became a student of High Sierra Ski Mountaineering. You can't study and learn about High Sierra Ski Mountaineering without being attracted to the Red Line. It's the best ski train in the lower 48 of the United States. It's the best weather of any major ski touring destination. It's a place where you can go long and light and alone. Jed went by himself and he was the first person to do it continuously. We were like, well, we're damn sure going to do it continuously if we can. Although the original party didn't, it just seems like the right thing to do. There was a time when Greg and I were talking about how are we going to do this mega shuttle because that's almost like the hardest part of these types of trips is the logistics. We thought, well, what about my dad? What if he took us down there? I called him to ask him. He picked up the phone and without ever saying anything, he just said, so do you need a ride? So he dropped us off at the trailhead. He camped with us the night before and it was so special because those mountains to him, it's his religion and he has so many memories and experiences there that he's always really tried to share with me. I've always tried to absorb and listen and hear his stories and look at his photos and now I feel like I share those experiences with him. All right, yeah, and just keep it nice and straight. All right, well, I'll we'll see right you when back. you come back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The first leg of the trip was a whirlwind. So much anticipation had built up preparing for the trip. When the time finally arrived to embark, it was surreal. But we were focused and we were ready. The main reason that we as a team wanted to do this trip is that you're completely immersed in the mountains for you know, almost three weeks and you're skiing all day every day and that is kind of a dream. And especially after a really long winter of work, we just wanted to be out in the mountains with no rules, no obligations, and purely just skiing. Greg rushed over to the line just to make sure it was in, because it's not in that often, and not many people have skied it. And he like ran away as soon as we got to the summit and then came back and he was like, we can ski it, thank God. And we did, and it was, powder, which we never, ever could have planned for. It's pretty damn good. Speak up, stand down, pick a battle. Because it was a record year, we expected to see like P 
people every single day. But because the roads were still covered in snow and there were so many issues clearing all the trailheads out in the springtime, we saw almost nobody. That was an unexpected part of the trip. Holy shit. We were just expecting to see skiers and tracks all over the place. We hardly saw anybody. It just seemed like the perfect trip at the perfect time. Yes, one of the trucks is unlocked. That was like literally powder. <laughs> days were so packed. It was wild. We skied Mount Whitney. It was awesome. We went to bed on cloud nine and then I had a terrible night of sleep with wind and then had to go up Mount Russell. And that was the first time I saw you be really nervous about our ability to climb it and descend it safely. trying to climb up it there. Ski stuff with our heavy packs. And our skis kept getting jammed in the chimneys. And just hoping that we were gonna be able to ski this descent that nobody ever skis. Final few feet to Mount Russell Summit here. We wouldn't have been able to climb back down the way we climbed up. It was pretty much full commitment. We were just not even sure if it was holding snow. So overcoming that crux was a big deal. It boosted our confidence for the rest of the trip. That was full commitment. There was no turning back. Okay, top of Mount Russell. Using Russell as a pass, that was pretty spicy. Scary. The last little bit. Climbing with heavy packs. We're gonna ski this north face. It's covered, it's super fucking steep. It feels pretty chalky. Just edgeable enough. All right, north face of Russell. It's fucking epic. 50 degrees at the top here. Jenna's finding the powder. It's good to put that one behind us and enjoy the ski. All right, Jenna. Now we're gonna do a little cruising and chilling. It's about noon time. Day three. Working a lot this winter, waking up really early. I was operating the snowcat, Greg was doing avalanche control for ski patrol, and we were dealing with these obscene amounts of snow every day. It became apparent at some point in the middle of the winter that this was gonna be a special season. I think we're pretty lucky and grateful to be just kinda of in the right place at the right time. We had our heads in the snow, we were skiing every day all winter mid to late February when the storms just kept on coming, we realized that this was going to be the season to do this once in a lifetime trip.
We had made it past the first crux and we were catching peaks in full form. We could not be stopped. And we just got in the <laughs> rhythm. It was like skin, yeah. cramp on ski, skin, cramp on ski. And that's what we did for days and days and days. We just got to the shoulder of Barnard. Diamond Peak, just another bump on the ridge. Acrodectes Peak. Forty little entrance. We just entered a whole new world on the crest. We are on the red line. Entering into that flow state and getting high off of the skiing and summiting peaks was so strong. We were fired up. We could not be stopped. That felt so good. You don't really want that high to ever end. That was the best. That was where we bonded, but it's hard to even explain how. It's hard enough to get into the flow state on your own for an extended amount of time and then realize it only afterwards. It's got better. But then to realize that you're both in this place, it's pretty special to share, I think. It's kind of something bigger than both of us. What is really special about sharing this experience with someone like Greg is that he's not super expressive, he's quite stoic, and he completely transforms when he just skis down a run that he has an amazing time on. I mean, his smile lights up. I would say it's like the happiest I've ever seen Greg. So those moments are really special because it's when he's the most expressive. That was sick. Cool. <laughs> nice work. That, that was fucking rowdy. I know, it was really steep. <laughs> That's rowdier than the like, main one. I know. Is it really? Yeah. I really will just never forget the sense of relief and joy on your face when we summited Mount Russell or after we skied Mount Whitney and some of the lines north of Bishop Pass. I'm just so grateful that we were able to pull it together and just have that experience. Yeah. Oh, that was awesome. That was epic. Oh man. That was like one of the best runs so far. There were a ton of logistics that went into planning this trip and they all revolved around us staying out in the mountains for the entire length of the trip and being self-sufficient. We brought about a pound of food per day per person, split up into three legs, so there's two food caches. This turned out to be a little light. Tom famously said, we had no food, we basically starved, but we were feasting on the scenery. So we figured we could do that. We were able to store one of our food caches in a five gallon bucket with a tight fitting lid and suspended it in a tree with a rope in hopes that nothing would mess with it. Yeah, I feel like it was one of these trees that was like hanging. There was a little anticipation because we were like trying to ski and remember where we put it, just really hoping it was there. Because if it wasn't there, basically our trip was over or we would have to go back to civilization and reset. You see it? Oh my God, that's a huge relief. Okay. We just picked up our food cache. It was still there. Feeling pretty good about phase one. We're gonna come out tomorrow morning, guns ablaze, and for the next eight day stint, we're psyched. The red line refers to when you're looking at a map, 
the crest of the Sierra has a red line in ink on the map. That's more technically why it's called that, but there's some elements from the founders of the red line that more refer to like pushing your limits and redlining the fun meter was something they said to describe it. They didn't lay out too many things. It was really to leave it open for interpretation and for people to kind of weave their own line. We wanted to pay honor to the people that blazed the trail before, but we definitely didn't want to be strict about it. Like we wanted it to be fun and we wanted to ski a lot and do it for the right reasons and not purely because we had objective goals. One of the things I was worried about throughout the trip was doing it in the style that other people would respect. I don't think I needed to worry about that as much during the trip, because just like doing it in your own style is so much a part of why these guys did it originally. It's called the Red Line because it's really the crest of the range. It divides the park from the national forests and counties and all that stuff. But what we really wanted to do is we wanted the Red Line, the fun meter. The Red Line Traverse is mainly an act of creativity. That's what I liked the most about it, was that I got to create my own experience. There's something in it for everyone. You can do as much or as little as you want. You can get as rowdy or as mellow as you want. I think that's really cool. That's what's pretty cool about it, is there's so much opportunity to put your personal mark on it and to keep stepping it up. The original Red Line was done in short pieces. It's no accident that the continuous red lines had to wait until a new millennium for the whole mindset of backcountry skiing to change. I can't believe we skied what we skied on those skis. What's different now is that we can ski up and over peaks and like ski kind of rowdy lines because the gear is just so advanced. The style of the day was essentially backpacking with Nordic skis. The skis the Red Line was first skied on are Nordic heritage skis. They come from cross-country skis. Cross-country skis are skinny, they're whippy little boards, they're light. We went as light as we could go with our skis and our boots and our poles that we felt comfortable with. Boots were leather, those laced up, the bindings were super fragile. To ski those faces, it wasn't the right tool. They were for like connecting the peaks. Alan Bard was Tom, this is an upside down. I go, what? He goes, it's totally upside down. He goes, we have huge packs, little teeny skis. We want little teeny packs, big skis. The style that everybody does now is Alpine Touring style, which is downhill skis and convertible bindings. You can lock the heel down just like every downhill binding does, but you can unlock it and be able to walk. 99.5% of all backcountry skiers are doing that style now because it's what they heard about and what they know. It just makes you respect the people going out and doing these things 40 years ago even more. What was so interesting about a trip this long is that you enter this extended flow state where you're still going through the daily motions of like keeping your body alive, eating and sleeping and skiing. The only time that really got disrupted was when the snow surfaces started to deteriorate. Over a trip this long, the conditions don't just stay good. I think on a trip like this, you're just hoping for things to be covered. That's all that we could really ask for. We figured that if they were covered, that we could ski them. In a week's worth of skiing, it's rarely ditto, 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 you know. To get smooth surfaces, favorable weather on a deep snowpack is a rare treat. To do so for over two weeks is 
virtually unheard of. I'd say that's a pretty special alignment of conditions. With the kind of change that spring brings, that snow has been consolidating storm by storm by storm. You don't have a force casting all the shadows where things are in and out, in and out. And every year is different. You can have the same amount of precip fall and not get where those contours fill like that and stay filled and then go corn instead of just get chopped up by the elements. With skiing, the sun is everything that can make or break the ski quality very quickly. But if it gets too much sun, then it can transition it into something that's not so enjoyable really quick. Yeah, I mean, it looks like it might go, but it also could just close out. The first part of the trip, it had just stormed four to eight inches of powder on top of the snow. And then throughout the middle of the trip, it got really transitional, which became pretty sloppy. The transitional snow was incredibly challenging because we are in really light gear, and our boots especially are quite light. With heavy packs, there was a lot of like unstable moments, skiing these really steep lines and like trying to do jump turns and double pole planning and just holding on for dear life. On the long scale of over 19 days, it was pretty good. It'd be hard to find better conditions and weather. Bye. Cool. There was one key moment where we were feeling so confident because we had skied so many cool lines in great snow. And then all of a sudden, we kind of got put in our place a little bit. You wouldn't call this rad? Uh, like knee deep toe stalling. <laughs> in slush. We were coming up and over coals and passes and peaks. Maybe they were scoured from the wind and we had to down climb. We were like, let's just go up this. I'm sure we can get down. We just were feeling so good and we totally got stuff. It was not skiable, it was complete rock. Right here. Yeah, it's probably the only dry couloir in the Sierra. That changed the tone for the whole trip. It changed our decision making process from there on out. You can look at maps and satellite imagery and read guidebooks and do as much research as you want, but with the Sierra, you never know until you get there. You never know if the coal is going to be passable until you get to the top of it. You can't research every single descent. Some of them just people haven't skied or there's no information available. And you can look out on the maps and Google Earth, but you just don't know until you get there. That's what moment skis are made for. Today was not a good day, really. Um, we just made a couple of uh, route finding choices that didn't work out, and pretty much we're forced to descend way lower than we wanted to around this feature. This kind of lateral ridge I had to go down to about 10, five to get around it and then come all the way back up. Uh, we spent most of the day doing that. We had a couple of, one non-eventful coal crossing this morning and then one sloppy one that didn't really work out. So, probably the worst day yet. <laughs> <laughs> It was pretty good until several days in a row where the snow was not freezing. Our skins were just getting so wet that they weren't drying out. It was getting challenging and that was a bit frustrating. The real doubt for me came after we picked up our first food cache. We just had a mega day with our full packs. It was a lot. It was like four or 5,000 feet a day for six or seven days straight all about 11,000 feet or higher. Skiing and climbing four 14ers in that first week and I was just tired physically. It's uh, the morning of day eight. We finally slept on rocks. It's the first time we slept on dry ground since the first night and it was a really nice change because 
it was quite a bit warmer and our stuff is just like not soaked. Yesterday was kind of a hard day for me. I, it sort of just all hit me, the accumulative load and effort and our packs were still super heavy and we had done a really big day the day before with our full packs of eight days of food and I just kind of bonked. When I started to feel physically weak, I started to doubt my abilities and that was kind of when I had the imposter syndrome thoughts like, do I deserve to be here? Like, have I earned this? You know, all these questions. I think those in everyday life sometimes too, but what people forget and I forget is that you really can do so much more than you think you can. I think the takeaway from that is everybody is trying their hardest to do what they want to do and follow their dreams. And you're not always a master of something. You're not always perfect at something. You just have to like forget about that stuff and do what you want to do. We did have to continue moving. You can't waste a day. You only have so much food. You only have such a weather window. Those moments, we did have to persevere. It's like an ever forward mindset. And that was something that Jed Porter said in his trip report. And that was our mantra, ever forward, ever forward. We had to think that way in order to be successful. If we ever thought that things were really hard, you just have to remind oh, yourself yeah. that somebody like Norman Clyde was carrying his cast iron pots on 100 pound backpacks and going up these places for the first time. And it makes everything that we did seem pretty easy, really. 40 years ago, when people just had paper topo maps and really no beta from anyone else, and they just like forged it out into the mountains to go ski and climb some of the biggest train around. I just admire the people who struck out into the mountains with that sense of adventure so much. Completing it now honestly seems like we're cheating with all the advantages we have with technology and information. It's leaps and bounds is much easier for us to both plan and carry out the trip. We can go through trip reports and we can look at pictures and guidebooks. If we were out there, we can get to the top of the peak and pull out our phones and give weather forecasts. We can use our satellite tracker to text our family and our friends and ask them what the weather is going to do for the next five days. And so it's two different worlds, really. We definitely had to kick down some cornices a handful of times. And one that stands out was V-Notch. We are at the top of the V-Notch. Ooh, yeah, it's still steep. We just chopped that cornice and climbed down. How was the climb down in, Jenna? I'm not much of a down climber, so. Yeah, it was kind of sketchy. All right, I'm skiing the V-Notch. We had down climb. That was scary, I don't like that. It was just super steep. Heavy packs, climbing down backwards. I'm not really a climber. That's not like my background. I'm more of like a look down the hill kind of person. So back to the hill going down was a little challenging for me. But we got some good platforms and this is gonna be a sunny powder run. Hopefully not too sunny though, because it's warm. We're psyched. That run in particular was unique because people normally climb up it and so you can get to the cornice at the top and you can just stop underneath it and ski down. But since we were coming up in the back, we had to figure out how to get through the cornice and cut a hole through it. It ended up being fine. It was total powder, so that was nice. It wasn't like down climbing in ice. The ski made up for it. Nice, babe. Coming in from the top, instead of climbing up, we got to the bottom and there was this huge birch run, which is a big crack like you see in Alaska where the glacier is peeling away from the mountain. V-notch, strand. Nobody had skied it for a while because they couldn't get over the birch run from the bottom. So if we were coming up from the bottom, we would have been like, well, we'll go somewhere else because of that huge crack. But we came down from the top and we're like, oh shit. And we were like, oh, we're not going to go back up. So we took off our packs and we chucked them onto the glacier. And it was kind of flat lights. It's hard to tell if it was a 20-foot air or a 5-foot air. It turned out to be somewhere in between. It was a little bigger than we thought it would be. Yep. Chucked our packs. Yeah. <laughs> Just like being at Kirkwood and 
jump into flat landings and shitty snow. But that was the only place to get through. We have arrived at the Palisades. How does it make you feel to think that she might be the first woman to ever do this? I don't know, I guess maybe surprised. I'm just happy that there's a woman who is in the first five people. It's a physical trip, but there's a lot more physical trips that women do all the time. People are climbing mountains and going to remote expeditions. Women are doing really incredible things. Okay, Mount Gilbert, secret East Kular, little sporty entrance. Jenna's paved the path for more women to do something like this that historically only had men doing it. Okay. Woo! Here we go. My biggest inspiration to ski and to spend time in the mountains is hands down my mom. She was skiing in the Sierra in the early 80s and I've always thought that if we were the same age at the same time, we would have been best friends. I'm definitely not the first woman to ski in the Sierra, and I just want to say there's so many strong, amazing skiers out there who come for me. And one of those is Kim Walker, who spent time on the red line with the original crew. You have to put yourself out there. To say you're gonna do it and then go do it is probably the hardest hurdle. Can I do it? Like, is it possible? Putting yourself into that unknown space where you are the only one who can answer that question, that was a challenge for sure. Oh man, legs. I do want other women to see that and say, I can totally do that. And it looks fun, you know? Like, I wanna go skiing for 19 days straight. I would love to see a small group of only women ski the red line. Oh. This is the Northeast Kular on Mount Humphreys. And uh, yeah, it was nice to kind of finally ski some sunny corn. We've been skiing a lot of variable snow because we're skiing a lot of Norths and don't often get to look at them first. So this is a nice treat. Feeling good after a couple hard days. We're just so pumped to be able to check this one off because this is one of the main peaks that was part of the original red line route. Cruising. <laughs> <laughs> I know, my legs were smoked. Last night, camping right beneath Mount Humphreys, looking out over the Glacier Divide, and we had like a two and a half hour long sunset. It was just glorious. It was really, really beautiful and calm, super memorable. Those are those moments that kind of make the struggle and strife worth it. And the skiing. <laughs> skiing. Skiing's skiing is just something we do now. Skiing is just a form of travel. I think we're starting to feel it, mm -hmm. for sure. I think the initial excitement and then the initial wave of tiredness have passed, and then the second wave of excitement, and now we're in the second wave of being tired. We had some decision-making fatigue. The trip was just one decision after another after another. How'd you sleep, Jenna? My watch says I slept zero hours, <laughs> zero minutes. The decision making became very difficult because not one of us was in charge. We both had to have our voices heard. Sometimes we saw things differently or weren't able to communicate just because of the fatigue. It's easier sometimes yeah. when you don't have to talk about decisions with someone else. The best part about being solo is that I was the only one making the decisions. And in many ways, that's a liability. You don't have another brain to bounce things off of. But time spent making decisions was non-existent. I'd make decisions in my own head, underway, on the go, and could just run and gun that way. And I love that about solo traveling in the mountains. I don't mind the responsibility, I don't mind the vulnerability of being solo either. I really wanted to call Porter, just like, oh, man, what are you doing out there? All by yourself? 
You're a badass. Did you have a tattoo for it? What did it do to you? I wanted to know. I wanted to know, like, what was that face like? What else? Oh, you freaking hey, you skied that thing. We were able to share all that and banter it and pass it back and forth. He had to do it all by himself. I mean, it's a totally different experience. He was redlining the fun meter, I guarantee it. It's going really good. We've skied, as of now, 17 rad lines in 11 days. How are our emotions? <laughs> How are our emotions, Greg? Right well, now, our emotions are on the upswing. I mean, uh, I don't have any emotions, so. <laughs> so by ours, you mean mine. Yeah. Uh, yeah, really optimistic and positive right now. I think we came over the hurdle of challenging travel and being cold and adjusting to having heavy packs and just the physical load every day. I think we kind of got through the hard part and now we're sort of just cruising. We're used to it and now I don't want to go do anything else. I just want to keep skiing forever. I think what's coming next is leveling up and we're gonna feel really good in the home stretch. Although we didn't necessarily make it look super pretty the whole time, <laughs> as far as our interpersonal dynamics, we did come out the other end successful. Knowing that we can do that together has given us both a lot of confidence in our partnership. We both had confidence in each other. We both knew that we could do it. We have sort of this like bar. We know we can do that much. Taking what we learned, we could do an even more extended or intensive expedition at some point. There's people that you can do that with. Hold on to those people and take them with you. <laughs> Come bring the sound Play with the sunshine Come let your hair down Let it lie About 10 of 7 on our 18th day. But we're gonna go up and ski red slate here. We're just waiting for the sun to maybe crest over, burn off this frost from our sleeping bags. We had a really awesome morning on red slate, and then we went over and skied bloody, and a lot of people have skied those, but it just felt like a strong way to cap off the trip. Going for a twofer in our second to last day. Gotta finish strong. Red slate. We're planning on being done tomorrow with the red line. Crazy. We just skied red slate, big milestone, and uh, we're ready to take off one more line for the day before calling it. And then tomorrow's our last day of the trip. like the most corny snow we've had. Anything else? No. No. <laughs> Wish us luck. Okay, hi mom. Hi, Nina. And Dad. We're, um, and Bob. We're at the top of our last mountain of the trip. I think we're ready to be done. We're we, so tired. We had a really good day yesterday. We came from back there 140 miles, just about. We think we're going to pull this thing off. 
Yeah, we just have like three more miles to go. So hopefully we can do it. We both woke up the last morning and we were just like, do we really need to ski the last peak? You know, because we didn't have to do anything. There's no rules. You know, we just wanted to ski a peak on the last day and a peak that we'd never skied. We really hey. just wanted to hit 80,000 yeah, feet. <laughs> yeah, true. So we did we were so one close. more peak. Pike a peak, bottom half, final run. I don't know if we totally processed it all yet. We want to feel like we've done something really cool. And it also just feels like we just kept skiing. I'm just so grateful to have this experience because I feel like everything had to come together exactly right and it may never again. I'm just so glad and proud of us that we went for it. Oh, baby. If you wanted to, you could map out every single little detail. We wanted to just go out there and leave some of it unexplored. We don't want to plan on every little move. We want to go out there and figure it out. I think being disconnected has an incredible value to it. When people discover stuff, as opposed to kind of this ephemeral look up, now I know kind of thing. It stays with you. You try so hard to look at maps and books and you do trips up into one drainage and you go skiing for a day or so and then you kind of piece it together. But this was like a comprehensive overview of the whole thing. To travel through every single drainage and see how they all thread together and understand what peaks and rivers and drainages are all connected. What's odd is that I ended up leaving the trip with more places I wanted to ski than I had before. It's bottomless. I do feel like I know the range more intimately now. You can take a million videos and pictures, but it will never ever compare to just standing in a basin surrounded by peaks, just immaculately carved and beautiful and covered in white. It was amazing. If you go there, you get that intimacy. That enchantment of just being in the mountains, covered with snow, all those shadows, all that texture. Don't cut yourself off from that experience. It'll knock you out. I hope that our abilities and creative capacity for mountain endeavors will increase faster than the information gets out there. Let's let ourselves be clever and creative. Let our peers and colleagues be clever with their mountain endeavors, given enough information to inspire, but not enough to prescribe what someone else's experience should be like. Maybe that's the art of it all. There's an art to that. There's an incredible... <laughs> There's an incredible amount of wonder that will be yours if you don't overstudy it. You will discover it. And it will be because you made choices that are just gonna be, it's gonna turn you on for the rest of your life. I like that. Here we are. This is the first road we've been even close to in 19 days. It feels weird to walk. 140 miles. We did it. We did it. <laughs> we fucking did it. We feels did it. good. Success. We did it. I'm so happy. Red line. Mm. What do you want to eat? Pizza. Pizza. It's got to be good pizza. And we want a breakfast burrito. Mm -hmm. And I, 
I want a beer, but I want it to be a good beer. Yeah, we want good beer yeah, and good beer. maybe tomorrow burger and fries. I think we're pretty lucky and grateful to be just kind of in the right place at the right time. We had our heads in the snow. We were skiing every day all winter. It was the best winter snow-wise that anybody's ever seen in the range. We had enough experience and knowledge. It's like we've been preparing for this forever, whether we knew it or not. You know, we designed our whole lives around being able to jump at these opportunities so to have something to all come together for us to be able to do it together is pretty good. It's about as good as it gets. Whether it's fate or free will, I think it's probably a combination of both. We capitalized on having all these ingredients there and we took the plunge. I think we also fell into something bigger getting advice from Jed and Tom. It was amazing. It feels like we're part of this long thread that connects through Doug and through Tom and goes back to Norman Clyde and Orland Bartholomew and hopefully goes on in the other direction to more people skiing and doing this trip. It just feels really cool to feel like for a short amount of time that we're on that line. They lay it out a style of fun, adventure, and jumping off into the unknown. That's really what it's all about, is the style more so than the numbers of all of it. It's not just about checking the boxes or clipping the bolts or making it to whatever slope it is. There's no prescription for it. It's not a defined, prescribed line. Each season, each skier is going to interpret it differently. So much of it is letting the spirit of the range really blanket the plan and the activity. This idea really sunk in when we sat down with Doug the day after we'd finished the trip. When Greg and Jenna came to me and asked about doing the red line, I was able to help them out with information and maybe pass on some of the attitude, which is, to me, more interesting than the information. <laughs> Like what we do with this. How do you feel afterwards? How do you feel during it? Why do we go out there? It's pretty obvious to me that you get high on what you do in the backcountry and any questions. <laughs>